How's it going, guys? D here, FGL Nerd Talk. Um, I got Derek Lipscomb uh, with Owl Eye Comics. How's it going, man? It's, I'm going, it's, everything's going good. I mean, considering everything in the world. <laughs> yeah, considering, of course. Yep. You just got to take it one day at a time. Uh, your comic, The Maroon, is what we're going to be talking about today. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other comics besides The Maroon out there? Um, I've worked on some comics that really haven't got a lot of widespread uh, exposure. I had a, a series that I collaborated with. I was just the artist on called Poverty Pack like years ago. It was a, it was a comedy series that uh, involved a bunch of superheroes who needed to get second jobs to maintain their, their lifestyle because they weren't rich. Um, they weren't like Bruce Wayne or like that. So no, I get it. Like I was wondering like, with that name and like you said, the comedy, it's like, it has to be pretty Pretty intense. Yeah. That's kind of like yeah. a stereotype with a lot, of, a lot of people of color. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. You know, it was kind of a little play on that, too. And I, I don't shy away from touching on subjects like that sometimes. Is that Sherlock Holmes in the group? Or uh, Sherlock Holmes type of character? Yeah, yeah, he's a Sherlock Holmes type of character. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at this. It's like, it's like Black Sportation, Sherlock Holmes, uh, raunchy superhero all right. together. The writer and I decided we were going to do an anything goes kitchen sink type storyline, and, and it gets pretty out there sometimes. Super so. tongue and cheek, I bet, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I read the Maroon. I read the first three issues of it. I know you got like uh, you said you're going to be doing 15 issues pretty pretty soon. The 15 issue pretty soon. Right. Um, the character Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Dude is a he's a beast. <laughs> And I read this first issue. There's going to be some spoilers in this, so I hope you guys aren't too angry. Um, I read the first issue, and I'm, want, I'm reading this. Like, you, you clearly see that Isaiah is biracial, and he meets this, uh, this Native American family. And he runs off, goes to the woods, and he finds this bear-like creature with giant horns in his face. And, like, and as soon as I saw that, I realized, like, he's, he's grabbing some elements that happened inside his era, but putting his own type of fantasy and maybe also Native American lore inside his story. What, what prompted you to do that? Uh, well, when I first conceived the character, uh, I, I hadn't heard of Maroons before uh, until I started actually uh, looking into my own family history in terms of, like, there's been always been talk that there's Native american first nation blood in our in our family um and i was curious as to how common that was and i had found uh, a few books that detailed uh, you know such things like uh the, the maroon the seminole the black seminoles down in in uh, florida and they were sometimes called maroons even though maroon is a term that uh, is more directly involved with uh jamaican rebels slaves that went out and they created their own communities and they fended for themselves i liked the idea behind it, this guy who is self-sufficient and I didn't have anything going on with him except the fact that I wanted to have a name that invoked mystery. So uh, I wanted to do kind of like a tall tale sort of series or something like a pulp series, kind of like a uh, Doc Savage or The Shadow or Lone I Ranger. Can, I can feel that most definitely. And I thought like... Uh when he met the Native American family, it was a father and son. I figured like the kid was going to live and it could be like, you know, him and a sidekick type thing. But like, that was not the case. This is not that type of story. And, and it, it, re it really flowed together. And like, you made me feel for it, even though like it was very quick with it happening. Right. Thank you. I, by the way, I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. I, and I, I, when I started coming up with these ideas in my head, it was originally just going to be a serialized comic book where it was like standalone stories each issue. Um, and then I wanted it obviously to take place in a time period where a black protagonist probably wasn't very common. So we have the 1850s time period where, you know, you think about it, most of, you know, most of us are either in servitude or, you know, we're free up north, but there, there's nothing really super prominent going on. Right. What, the history, what history will tell us. It starts out in Tennessee, like the first issue does. Right. Did you, did you take any kind of like uh, cues from the past? Or did you just pick places that had a lot of like Dixie type of roots with slavery inside of it? Yeah, I kind of wanted to, to, to pluck them right in the middle of, you know, the hot spots, you know? Louisiana, uh, Kentucky, Florida. Right, right. Because he, he's, he's, he's originally from Florida 
and he got into some trouble in Georgia, as you probably read in issue two. Right. And he's been on the run since then. So when the series starts, he's already he's already made it to Tennessee. Um, wow. I I like I had a moderate interest in history, somewhat in U.S. history. Um, but I think this made me really engorge in it a little bit more. But I didn't want it to be just a historical, uh, you know, adventure book. I wanted, I like, obviously I'm a comic fan. And so I wanted to have something a little more like captivating for audiences. So I added, you know, all kinds of things like supernatural and, and mythical and, you know, uh, folklore, all of that. I wanted to put that in there. And we were talking of- before <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> Issue three is where that supernatural part really just takes off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it has like, I don't, let me try to find the best way to put it. It has a lot of um, like old school 80s and 70s horror feel to it where right. we're like creatures or animorphs, but they have like the meat suits of humans. And mm-hmm. it's like the ritual of the tradition of the, the Native American spirituality to it, but it's in a dark kind of mode to it. And there's right. a lot of lies in the seat, a lot of blood. Uh, is is that like the main goal you were trying to go for? Or did you or did you do that just uh, just so people can see how dark and bloody it was in that time? I I made a conscious decision that I was going to to kind of not, not hold any punches when I did this series. I, one of the things that uh, with the previous series that I had worked on, I I felt like um, the comic book audience is no longer kids when it was like when I was growing up. I think all everybody grew up with comics. We can talk about that that whole thing like for days. It changes from Absolutely. kids to adults to kids to adults. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I you know every time I've gone to a comic store, I, the clientele was always like thirty to forty somethings. Men mostly, yeah. Exactly. And I and I thought about it I'm like, I mean if you know, what do we like? You know what I mean? We go to the movies, what, what kind of movies do we want to see? We usually go to the R rated movies or action movies, or just high adrenaline type right. movies and stuff like that. So I, I uh, you know, I know I knew I was going to try to make this like a R-rated movie. Um, but then I came across a couple of, you know, things I had to analyze internally. I'm like, do I want to, how far do I want to go with this? Do did, I you, wanna... did you grab any elements from uh, from Tarantino? Like, I, I get a bit of a Django Unchained vibe, but like, is... It is only there with the time period, not the characters. Like the characters right. have no resemblance to Django and Chan at all. But like the time period there really makes me think about that film. Did you gather any uh, any inspiration from that, or was like this just like something you just just did and that was that? It was really. I, I mean, I had been kind of uh, I'd been kind of putting this character together in my head for a number of years. I think Django was really helped me push myself to put this thing out here and 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 take a lot of risks. I mean, I mean, some of the language I use, you know, it's tough to write as a it person is. of color. It is. But I feel like it was very necessary because, again, it's a black protagonist in 1850s. He's going to be called some things, especially if he's an outlaw. He's running. And that, um, That's like one of the most interesting things that you put inside of your story. Like, again, only read the first issue, but like when the insults are there, mm-hmm. uh, it's not seen so much as hateful, even though right. like that's what it is. It seems more like, like this is just the way it is, and this is how we talk to these people of this time. And I imagine that's the language of the time. You know, that was how it was back then. They was probably thrown around as freely as all you know, you know anything else. And that's what I kind of wanted to convey was that it kind of also thickens the odds that are against them when you see how many people have disregard and very little regard for people of color back then so you know okay we have this guy he's out on his own he's trying to get somewhere he's got lawmen bounty hunters anybody who would take advantage of his situation he's got a lot of things stacked up against him on top of supernatural elements coming to get him and not not to mention like also his his horrific trauma that that attacks him every time he closes his eyes right right like he he thinks he's either like a monster or demon because mm-hmm. like every time he closes his eyes, he sees the people that he's killed and wonder like, what is his problem? Why, why does he keep surviving all this? Or why does he uh, keep killing all these people? Because I think like you just said before, he, he lives in that time and right. he knows like, like this is probably something that he shouldn't be doing. He's wrestling with that. At least that's, that's the impression I got. Am I, am I off when it comes to oh, that? 
No, you're right. You're right. He's, I mean, obviously, like you can tell just by the first issue, he's not, he's not very, uh, he's not really sure about who he is at this point. He right. knows he's, he's done, he may have done something really bad. He knows he's in trouble. Um, he's obviously aware that he's got certain enhanced abilities. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of questions. He doesn't even really know his name. He's given a name. Yeah. Uh, you? So. <laughs> I want to talk about that, but first, let's take a break from talking about your story. I want to talk about some news that's going on right now. Okay. Uh, Star Wars, the Ewan, Ewan McGregor story with that Obi-Wan Kenobi. Are you right. a big fan of Star Wars? Uh, I was. I kind of dwindled in the past couple of years. <laughs> I can understand why. Disney, Disney does that to people. But <laughs> we're, we're, not a, we're not a pro Disney podcast, just so you know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Obi Wan Kenobi has a TV show coming out, and they're going to be gathering elements from uh, the technology from the Mandalorian and mm -hmm. putting that into the Obi Wan Kenobi show. Uh, do you think that's going to make the show the show more interesting or less interesting? Because when I heard that, I'm watching the Mandalorian, one of the, the third episode right now, and I'm not a fan. Right. But uh, maybe with Obi Wan Kenobi and a lightsaber and the Force, it can be different. Like, what are you are you interested in that? Does that make you want to get back into the Star Wars? Universe? I, I, I personally, I actually enjoyed the Mandalorian. Okay, uh, but I'm really curious as how they're going to, to set this Obi Wan Kenobi one because obviously, my impression. Well, if if I'm looking at it from his his history already on screen, where does he go? I mean, he was on Tatooine the last time we saw him. For how long? Yeah, yeah. So what is he doing? Is this series going to show what this guy's been doing on Tatooine the whole time? And, <laughs> and it. <laughs> So like he's just like being like just uh, that's a everyday good guy because if he's going around a sport in different universes and worlds, like uh, why didn't he just restart the Jedi? So yeah, right. right. I, I don't I don't know um, I don't know what this is going to entail. So I'm curious, um, and I'm always willing to give Star Wars another shot. Um, but more <laughs> times than often, I'm usually left like uh, I wish I never. It's been rooted in us, man, since the '70s. Yeah. It's just been ingrained into us. You must yep. like this. Yep. I've seen almost every uh, of the feature films in theater, save for the last one. Dude, you and me both. I watched everything but uh, Rebels, pretty much like oh, the new animated series. Yeah, I watched great. everything but that. Oh uh, yeah. But I, oh no, oh, I haven't watched the last uh, the was it the Skywalker film? I haven't seen that. Yeah, no, I haven't seen that one. So, so that's what yeah. I haven't seen. I uh, I didn't mind. Uh, was it a uh, Rogue One? That was oh god. You thought know, it was just okay? I thought it was great. Oh, well, no, I, I think the third act is what was really... Important. Okay. Yeah, when, when Vader shows up and, like, all everyone, like, all you know... All outs to the, and then it really did kind of feel like it was seeding right into A New Hope, and I thought that was uh, that was genius. Agreed. I, I, I wish there was more movies like that. I think um, there was some missteps. Solo was a misstep for me. A lot of people like it. I was not excited after it finished. I guess I, I should put that on the list. I haven't watched. I haven't watched Solo either. Like I know Donald Glover's in it. I just haven't gotten around to he's it. He's great in that. He's great. Don't he's part of the best part. Yeah, it's worth a it's worth a look. But honestly, it doesn't move anything forward for me. It, it almost feels like they're doing check marks about things you know about Han Solo and putting it in. That. <laughs> you know does, it, does it explain why he shot first? Does it, does it give you like an answer <laughs> to that question? Because he did. Make up, they kind of make up for that in a little. A little in a weird way towards the end, but um, ridiculous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's get back to uh, to the maroon. I need to start putting like breaks in this so I can go back to this kind of stuff. But that's that's that in the future. Uh, you said characters from the past or figures from the past. Uh, there was a character, it was Matilda Coffin. Right. She was impersonating herself as being Harriet Tubman. Correct. Is that going to happen a lot? Are you going to put like a lot more figureheads, or have you already done that? Put a lot more actual figureheads. I've, uh, I've included uh, William Still. Um, well, it's all right. I, uh, you know, I haven't done. Actually, I haven't done a whole lot as much as I wanted to. I, I basically have to obey the story. So I'm at this point now, and it's funny that that as soon as issue three kind of cracked open everything, um, the story kind of wrote itself for me. And so I've been kind of what do you mean by that? It, it, it wrote itself. It just felt like there's it, everything was very instinctful. It wasn't like I didn't feel challenged with what am I going to do next for the next story? What am I going to do for, you know, how is this arc going to end and everything like that? It, I have a, I have 
stories mapped out enough for five volumes of uh, collected trades. Each with you know each is like six issues per trade. Um, I'm almost done with the third volume. So um, I figured out basically his whole, I guess his whole five, you know, story arc uh, saga. Okay. Yeah. So the idea with this in the long term thing is that I'm going to end it at the fifth, uh, the fifth story arc, and then leave this long period of time open, which is going to be the Civil War. So are we going to see Nate Turner in this at all? He actually plays a really big part. What? Uh, he well, he plays a really big part because he's actually uh, he predates this about twenty years. Okay. But his legacy plays a really big part in one of the uh, the characters. Wow. And actually, not in this issue I'm working on fifteen, but in sixteen, that's when it's all going to be revealed. So um, he does. Uh, it's interesting that you brought that up because I'm like, wow. I mean, that's that's one of the characters that I did want to feature in there, <laughs> in, in to some degree, and, and I'm able to do it. But it's it's all through flashback. So, and uh, I know there. I'm not sure about like the the Native American lineage or heritage from the mm-hmm. past in that time. Did you grab any Native American figureheads from that time and put them inside the story? No, um, I I did not actually. Uh, it's I've tried to do a lot of research on like seminal peoples and stuff and it's very broad and general online and gotcha. books and stuff like that. So I didn't really want to, I didn't want to misinterpret anything. So I keep things really generalized when it comes to that. that makes sense. Like, you can kind of put yeah. your foot in your mouth or you go the wrong direction. So I get it completely. Absolutely. And so that, that's like my handle on that is just like, okay, I'll just keep that at a very surface level as I can. If I want to deepen the, you know, delve deep into something, I need to have enough material where I feel comfortable with it. When it when it came to writing the the white characters, like male, mostly the white male characters, um, was that hard for you? Ah, uh, you know, <laughs> some I, of had, it, to, had to ask, had to ask the question. Oh no, no, I'm trying to I'm trying to uh, kind of like sort that out. Yeah, obviously, um, a lot of that is influenced by other forms of media and stuff like that. Um, but then there's a lot of things where I think of people I've encountered in my past and how they are in a certain disposition that they have. Um, so it wasn't that it was difficult or anything like that, but I was, it's really hard to, to distinguish some of them sometimes because a lot of them are just adversaries and they just, you don't really have enough time to develop them. So they all start to. And I'm pretty sure like you wouldn't want to develop them any more than they need to be at most times considering, you know. Yeah, most of them serve a purpose. Uh, and then, you know, in future issues, you'll see that he starts to befriend here at some, well, at some of them, he just he has them tagging along for reasons. And, um, you know, it, th- there's some development going on in there. And you'll okay. definitely get some good arcs in that if you choose to go and continue. <laughs> oh, I'm going to keep reading it. It's, uh, it's too good, like, to stop reading the story. It's, it's really compelling. It really is. Thank you. Like you, you, you put a lot of heart and soul inside of this, and I can definitely tell that. Even with the with the sex scenes that you have inside of it, like they're not, they're not like uh, some of those other comic book companies that just like want to put gratuitous sex inside of it, just have gratuitous sex. Your right. yours has a purpose, and it's uh, it's tasteful, and, well, until it's until it's not, you know. Until, yeah, and I'm yeah. sure <laughs> I've heard a, a couple of a few past few issues, I might have thrown in some gratuitous, but nothing like you know. I don't spend a whole lot of time on it. You know, it does it does kind of serve a purpose, but it's very you know. It's not very fanfare. It's more like right. like, like the story is telling you that this has to happen. And I also made sure that I made it look like it's from its time. It's not glamorous. You know what I mean? It's not right. like steamy. These these things are kind of grim, gritty, and <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like, like, again, like, again, the third issue. Again, just bring that up. The third issue is uh, that's where it really takes off. Yeah. 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 So. I, I really wanted to add that realism to it. You gotta. I have to remind constantly the reader, this is not modern day. This is this is something that, you know, happens pre Civil War. <laughs> Nothing's comfortable. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. And like reading it, like do what's going on right now. It's not. Uh, reader beware is what I what I can say to you. Right. Right. 
the, uh, there was something very interesting you did with uh, with the first issue. Yeah, the first issue take place during real time, and then like you did something with the second issue where you had to take place two months before the first issue, and the story is like kind of continues on to like we catch up with them in like in the first issue. Right. Why why do you decide like to back to backtrack and show us more of a story in that way instead of just doing a flashback? Well, I think it was important to further elaborate on what he's running from and what he's got going up against him uh, as he's as he's you know basically it being on the run like i mean you i could have just done the real time and just have random bounty hunters and stuff pop up after him but i actually wanted to kind of uh, establish some bounty hunters and and lawmen with names uh especially the character of hinton who has a, a you know a deep rooted bone to pick with this character right um he he goes on to become a thorn on his side quite a bit um and so he was it was really more for his benefit to establish this guy is you know willing to even front up more money to get this guy and um i really wanted i really wanted to do that i really i really feel like you know you have to have a really good villain to make the hero seem even more heroic if Batman taught me anything, that's absolutely true. That's that's exactly right. And, and so, <laughs> you know, I didn't I didn't want to just be like, okay, you know, this is going to be a one issue villain. I have a I have a bunch of those, and that, and that happens, you know, quite often. But um, I also needed to have a kind of an arch nemesis um, that's also trailing him as well. So that that's who Hinton is. I appreciate that. Like, it's a it's a it's a good good like you know good and evil kind of story even though like the good is wavering from anti-hero to true hero it's uh it's, it's a good struggle like i really can't keep praising the story enough i know like, i i probably do this a lot like most of the people listen to this like uh, he really goes crazy with all the comic books i try to find all the best qualities of a comic book and like yours has a lot thank you yeah thank you. that really means a lot because honestly i i never uh i never saw myself as a writer i always thought i was just gonna get a, a comic book artist um, so this is the first time I've actually really tried my hand at writing. Have you done uh, any, do you do any of the panels on these comics? I, I do everything. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I mean, save for some editing. I have, um, I have some friends, uh, Brian Coles, his wife, Rose, and my friend, Alondra Mendoza, they all uh, help like script doctors sometimes. Um, I, I definitely still struggle with dialogue sometimes. So they help me out or they they're there to suggest things and I can choose whether or not I want to go with it or go with my gut. I noticed so, that with the, with the Harriet and her calling herself Matilda after like, you didn't really give like a, a suggestion where like where he told or she told her, told him her name. It's right. more like, like later on, he knows that's her name and like, right. it just goes from there. Right. None, none of the silly, uh, like uh, introductions you see in comic books. And like, honestly, it threw me off at first, but right. then I realized what you were doing. Like, like this is supposed to be natural. It's not supposed to be like, like my name is, my name is Harriet Tubman, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It goes from there. Like you didn't want to do that. And like, I appreciate that. And I, I like to throw little nuggets of history in there. If people know their history, they'll pick up on things. Uh, like for instance, in issue two, there's all that, the whole thing with the, uh, uh, the tapestry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I was that. Yeah, so people who know like things like that, they'll 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 get the reference, um, and I, I like to throw that in in several issues. So they're there. <laughs> I I have a question, but I'm pretty sure you can't answer it. But the, how long is the Isaiah going to go on this journey? How long this journey is going to last for? Uh, well, I, I like, right like now, I said, you probably you probably can't answer it. I'm not going to push it on you, but I yeah. Give you a I could probably give you a ballpark. I mean, right now he's already almost at a year wow. in his journey right now. So he said the civil war starting soon too, right? Yeah. He's, I mean, this is pretty much on the cusp of it. So there's a lot of tension going on. Ooh. So that's, that's gonna, that's gonna make things for a little hot for him. If they are already hot enough, you know? Okay. I got an interesting question for you. This is one I got this off the cuff. <laughs> is he part of the reason why the civil war gets started? <laughs> you can't answer it you can't answer it i got it it's fine <laughs> i mean that's an actually a good question but honestly i never really considered that uh he was really intended to be kind of a hidden history guy gotcha like forrest gump type here there but i mean if it was up to hinton i would say yes <laughs> <laughs> I like that that's good <laughs> 
Uh, we're gonna take we're gonna take a narrow, narrow break from uh, from your story. And um, have you been watching the DC show Stargirl? I haven't yet. I, I know. Haven't. I think it's only on the CW and DC Universe, those two apps. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a character, Doctor Midnight. Uh, if you're familiar with DC, you know who that character is. Yes. They decided to change that character over and uh, make make the character a girl, uh, mm -hmm. Angelica Washington, and make mm -hmm. her a kid also. Wow. Do, do you like having that interpretation with characters switching over and having like a, like different tellings? I mean, I, for me, that's essentially what comic books are, just different retellings and reshapings of stories that we already know. But like, does it, does it get to you at all, considering like for the story that you have going on right now? I guess it depends on my attachment to the character. You gotcha. Know? Um, you know, sometimes, or if it feels too much like it's pandering. You know, like if it's just being done for the sake of being provocative, I don't... I don't know how I necessarily feel about that. I mean, and it's also an execution as well. If right. it's done and it's done well, then I have no problems. But if it's done and it's shameless, then I kind of go, uh, you know, like, I don't want to be. We could have we gone without this. Yeah, yeah. 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 I no, I get that. I get that all too well. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in the case of, I like Dr. Minette, I like the Justice Society and um all that all the characters in there so also you're a fan that's good right on i was a huge dc fan in the 90s especially i'm still a fan but i mean like i was really in the 90s i was collecting flash and justice society and um you know my i i was the justice league um my my brother had a friend from art school who was illustrating at howard porter and um i was following his run on it and uh you know i i really enjoyed a lot of the characters. What actually got me into DC, believe it or not, was the original Flash TV show with uh, John Wesley Chip. And okay, I, uh, the the first, the one that came out in the nineties. Right, right. It was after all like the Batman movies came out, and then they tried to do like a small screen version of Batman with the Flash. Right, and then uh, I think the Mantis came out a little bit after that. Yeah. Right, I remember that. Yeah. So I think uh, once the Flash came out, I I was really interested in how much was being uh, translated from the comic on the screen. And I started reading those books and then I just got sucked into the world of DC. And I was Oh, wow. That's what did it for you, huh? That was my gateway. You know, wow. I, was, I always liked Batman. Everybody likes Batman. It's it was an animated series for a lot of us. Yeah, that and X-Men. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, that was for me anyway. That, even before that, I was, I, I mean, my older brother, he, he grew up in, like, he was born in the late sixties. So he was a fan of the, the Adam West series. Adam and you know, weird kids. When we were kids, we didn't know that was camp. We just thought, that's, <laughs> that's how Batman is. <laughs> yeah. But then we started looking at the comic books and like, wow, these just feel so much different. But yeah, so good, you know, so. Well, depending on when you start reading the comic books, because in the, in the Silver Age, it was nothing but camp. So, yeah. 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 So, and then, by the way, rest in peace to Dennis O'Neill, because. Oh, yeah. Jeez, that man created so much, like the Al Ghul family. Yeah, he, uh, he killed Jason Todd. He created a question. He also pushed the envelope on social issues too. Right? Yes, he did. He uh, he was the reason why Roy Harper is addicted to to drugs. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I remember all of that. Uh, like I have a couple issues of of Batman he wrote, and when I was little, and it's funny because I was just thinking about that earlier, that um, how comics were always in the house, and uh, we'd go see my grandmother. I used to live back east. I, I was born in Rhode Island. Okay. And. Uh, We'd go visit her, and she'd have a drugstore at the end of her street. We'd go there, and she, her, or my grandfather would have us. You know, they would either buy us the comics, or they'd tell us to pick it off the rack. And <laughs> we had like, I had the most craziest assortments, man. I had like, you know, one time I'd have Conan, then I have Daredevil, then I have Smurfs number one, and then I have like, you know, it was just all over the place. Did just, you read them all? Or did you look at the pages? Oh, yeah. oh I read them all. I read them oh, all. Oh man, that's probably like the important reason why they asked you to grab comic books. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tricky parents like that's kind of what got, my mom got me into into it the same way also she uh heard about the death of superman took me to a comic book shop and after that i've been reading comic books ever since so yeah so that was your gateway huh that's the cool. death of superman i know pretty sad isn't it <laughs> no i remember that it was a huge event and it was like you know that was getting media coverage and everything and oh yeah and then the armbands and, and everything people were buying multiple copies of that <laughs> <laughs> out of droves yeah now uh now it's been done so many times and redone so many times it doesn't hold uh hold the same kind of feel of it before yeah that's the problem i mean you can't do something that 
that drastic too many times. You have to you gotta switch it up. Yeah. And, and oh, are you gonna say kill someone like and leave them dead, right? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I knew they were gonna bring them back, but like it's just in the way that you know, do it in different mediums too. Now it's like oh, we're gonna, you know, in the movies they killed them off, you know, and then they brought them back, and you know, it's it's done a lot. No, I get you. Uh, I think about Wolverine the way he died, the way he came back. They should have just left him dead for a oh, little yeah. bit longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he was covered in antimony. Like, like, yeah. How do you beat that? <laughs> you're like it was like seriously, you're covered. You're covered in adamantium, dude. Like you can't get out of that. So yeah, that's your coffin. But he's back. <laughs> don't don't know how. I just I just let it go. So <laughs> uh, to get back to your story, uh, I read a little bit ahead. There's a character named Stag Jeffrey Montgomery. Yes, and he he just happens to be married to a black woman in that time. Also, like what what prompted you to create this character? Like why? <laughs> Why? Why this character in that time period? Oh no, he he he's not in that in that one. He does have a white he does have a white wife. He's a friend of Matilda. Okay. He's a previous friend of her, and so she knows him. And um, it, if you're starting with issue four, you, she takes uh, Isaiah there to to recover. Right. She was outside the window. I I read wrong. That's on me. My that's apologies. Fine. No, that's fine. I, I um, but it, he's he's definitely a character that I had the, the kind of like well all i've shown was very very hostile white men so far and he's he's still a hostile character he seems but like i needed to have one on his team for once you know <laughs> yeah and but his wife seems very uh, very frigid also yeah. so yeah right and and again i think that probably was a common thing back then i think people had their boundaries especially with you know black people and such being in their household right you know and so i think the attitudes that i try to ha have you know give people in, in the series i feel like come from a very real instinct from that I, it's weird because you you kind of have to force yourself to look at it from the opposite side in some cases and it's like uh, you know <laughs> it touches you know. some elements yeah yeah no it does it does and it's it's difficult but you, you know it, it it's also very like you know it, it in, in a weird way this this book has been kind of therapeutic in, in you know dealing with issues of of race and everything like that and it's kind of odd that we're where we are right now yeah in this time period where it's like you know when i when the book was first released that was like 2017 the topics that people kept bringing up to me about this book was like, well, with Black Panther being a big movie coming out, are you getting a lot of interest in the book? And it was very positive and it was very like, oh, do you think this is going to open doors and then and, then, and so on. And now I feel like with everything that's going on, this, this could change a completely different yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? Have you pitched any companies like for a film or TV show? Uh, I haven't. Honestly, I'm so dedicated to the medium of just doing the comics. Doing right comics, now. wow. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't want to write this necessarily with the intent of this is going to be a great TV series or movie. I'll leave that up to somebody that might look at it and suggest it to me who's in the business. Um, I feel like if you do that, if you prepare your book with the intent of it becoming something else, then you just don't develop down. Yeah, I think you just kind of you're missing all the things you could do in the comic book medium you know, that, that can make this a great experience. So, um, go ahead. You have 15 issues so far. You, uh, you say you want to do five volumes. Yes. Um, is there going to be an extended universe in this? Like I, I, I never really use the word extended universe when it comes like to a story like this, but is there going to be an extended universe? Is there going to be other characters inside that same world that we're going to get to see and, and interact I, uh, with? I, I sort of started building things here and there with the possibility of it. I'm not saying it will happen, but there's characters who are also gifted in different ways that um, you'll be introduced to. So I'm not going to say yes or no to that right now. Uh, it depends on where my energy level is. <laughs> I can understand that. Like uh, given the times right now, like the energy is far, far free and low and like everyone else tired. Yeah. Uh, I get it. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, juggling a full-time job and, uh, you know, two kids and a wife 
not that I'm juggling the wife and the kids, but it's, that's, <laughs> that's really cool. I'm, I'm juggling. I'm juggling mine, so it's fine. Don't worry yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to keep my sanity while this is going on. Believe me, I, can, yeah. I completely understand it. Yeah, I, I feel fortunate enough that I'm able to produce what I've been able to produce, given those circumstances. So, well, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for reading this. Thank you. Thank you. I, that really makes it, like I said, it validates everything that I do. Whenever someone says something like that, I feel like, okay, this is exactly what I want. <laughs> and you got, you got to keep going. Like, uh, I'm not sure like how far you want to take this road. Like, I was going to ask you what your goal is for this, but uh, it seems like, like, you know, you don't just think this take this course. Like just going to yeah. let the story tell you where it should stop and where it should yeah. keep going. I mean, I, ha I do have an end story, but that is for a number of years down the road when he's fairly an old man. Wow. <laughs> wow. All right. Any uh, any time travel is going to happen in this? You're going to go like super sci-fi or you're going to keep it fantasy? You know, you never know. I, <laughs> I, I would, you, you surprised know, me with that answer. I wasn't expecting that. I, you know, I, I would I normally have said, no, nah, you know, I'm trying to keep it very tight and stuff like that. But you never know. I, I think about the history of characters in comics and how they've had to change things just to kind of keep going. Stay, you know? Yeah, to stay interesting and I don't know if I would I would do it just for the, the sake of that. It obviously, it has to make a lot of sense um, to do some things with these characters, but I'll never say no to like some wild ideas. You know what I mean? And the only reason I ask that, and this is gonna be my last question, like this character Isaiah is so impressive, so stoic. Uh, I, I will call him a Mary Sue, but he gets his ass kicked quite a bit sometimes, and like <laughs> he has to go, he has to go like lay down and recuperate for every every now and again. But like when he takes someone on, he really takes them on. Like right. hardcore, right. so uh, I gotta ask, like, where's his parents and all this? Like, who who are the people that made this made this person? You know, you'll find out. Okay, <laughs> right on. <laughs> Best answer right there, man. <laughs> uh, so, but I'm glad you asked, because yeah, that's 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 things that are coming. That's been popping up, and it's it's really coming to a head. So, because if he, if he's this good at being alive and staying alive, like his parents have to be something else. They, well, they, they, they have to be. They're definitely something else. You'll see. Ah. <laughs> is, it, is it in the first volume, or do I got to keep reading to find out? You're going to have to keep reading. Oh, now. yes. That's, 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 long. that's what I want to hear, man. <laughs> yeah. story, right on. I mean, the second volume, I, I start to tap into aspects of his father. Okay. So start to learn about him. Um, and then we'll eventually get to his mom. Because those of you listening, if you, if you haven't read this yet, the first three issues I read, uh, actually the first four issues now, because uh, I, I, I read pretty quickly. Well, uh, the first four issues, uh, nothing about his parents whatsoever is talked about. So a character like this doesn't talk about his parents at all. Like, the parents got to be pretty impressive. They, they just have to be. Right, right. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited to, to <laughs> see you, uh, your reactions to the future. Uh, <laughs> if I, if I, when I get this book, and um, you just, just check the... Check the FTO page whenever it comes out because I may pull some spoilers on there. Just saying, just throwing <laughs> it out there. That's fine. <laughs> it's, been out, it's been out for some time, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> Good to hear. <laughs> Anything else you want to let us know before we uh, before we end this? Um, just uh, you know, if you're curious and you want to check out my book, you can uh, go to themarooncomic.com. That's my my main website. It's kind of my hub. I'll, I'll put that can. in the description. Thank you um you there you'll be you can uh find my book uh, on amazon uh under kindle uh you can go to comiXology it's there um if you want a physical copy you can order it from indie planet um and my if you want to sign up for my newsletter i give you updates of you know when the next issue is going to be coming and other things like where i'll be signing books or, or so on and so forth and what's uh, your uh what's your youtube not youtube what's your uh, twitter and instagram handle my Twitter is at Owl Eye Comics, and my Instagram is also uh, at Owl Eye Comics. And I have a Facebook page, The Maroon Comic. All right. That's it. That's, uh, that's, that's how you do it. Uh, are there going to be any female protagonists that actually live inside of story? Because so far, a lot of them have been, <laughs> been dying left or right. Yeah, absolutely, there will be. Okay, um, cool, cool. I, I um, but I have to make sure I do that, do them right, do them justice. I, you know what? I can completely understand that. Like, uh, you want to make sure like they're they're done the best way possible because all this killing and death, and you gotta have someone who can hold up to that or be as just as good as Isaiah. I completely understand that. Right, right, absolutely. And so for me, Matilda is a very strong character. Um, 
not in the way that Isaiah is, but I think that even Isaiah respects her enough that he sticks with her. So right. um, she's, she's one example of it. I have another character. This is not necessarily a strong character, but she's a protagonist that happens later on uh, named Venus. But you'll, uh, you'll see things regarding her as well that are pretty interesting. So right. um, yeah, they're there. They're, they're popping up. So, Well, that's, uh, this has been Derek Lipscomb with uh, Owl Eye Comics. Check him out on Twitter and Instagram. Check out his comic, buy, buy the comic. Help out black creators because we all need to do that. Or just help out creators in general because, you know, this comic book is pretty damn awesome. So this has been D, FGL Nerd Talk. Derek, I appreciate you joining me, man. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. You guys take it easy. All right.